In March of 2010, the United States Congress passed the Affordable Care Act. The goal of this legislation is to ensure that everyone in the country has health insurance, which seems reasonable. However, it has become one of the most contentious political issues in years. Some people think it will rescue America from spiraling health care costs, while others think it represents a drastic government overreach. So how does health insurance work? And does it have to be so divisive? To keep things simple, imagine a country with only four people. Chris, Kate, Ginny, and Matt. And where the only medical procedure is a $40,000 heart surgery. Chris was a Marine and does triathlons, and only has a 1% chance of needing heart surgery in any given year. Kate's and Ginny's probabilities are a bit higher, while Matt... Well, Matt has a congenital heart defect and has a 50% chance of needing surgery. So how much should he, and everyone else, be willing to pay for health insurance? To determine this, we can use what economists call expected value. Since Chris has a 1% chance of needing a $40,000 surgery, his expected value is $400. This is how much he's willing to definitely pay now to avoid the possibility of paying $40,000 later. For Kate and Ginny, the expected values of insurance are higher. And for Matt, the highest risk person of all, insurance has an expected value of $20,000. Because his probability of needing surgery is so high, insurance is worth the most to him. Now watching this whole situation is the insurance company. While consumers are thinking about insurance in terms of expected value, it's thinking about it in terms of expected cost. Chris, he represents an expected cost of $400. Kate, $6,400. For all four people, the insurance company expects to spend a total of $36,800 on heart surgeries. Again, to keep things simple, Let's assume the insurance company charges a single price for health insurance and only needs to break even. In this case, it will charge each person $9,200. This is way more than Chris's expected value, so he's out. So is Kate. It's a great deal for Ginny and Matt, though, so they buy insurance, and the insurance company collects a little over $18,000. But here's the thing. It expects to spend $30,000 on their surgeries. This means that next year it's going to have to raise the price of insurance, at which point Ginny leaves, leaving only Matt. In the end, the insurance company has to raise the price again, and 75% of the country is uninsured. What a mess. So who's to blame? Well, maybe it's Matt's fault. He's the reason insurance was so expensive. So let's try this again. This time, what if the insurance company is allowed to not cover Matt because of his pre-existing heart condition? For the remaining three people, the company expects to spend a lot less on surgeries than before and only has to charge $5,600. That's great for Kate and Ginny, but it's still too expensive for Chris. Like before, the insurance company expects to spend more than it collects and raises the price in the second year, leaving only Ginny. Once again, three quarters of the country is uninsured, and that's pretty dangerous. Because what happens if Kate, who very reasonably decided not to buy insurance, ends up having a heart attack? She's still going to go to the hospital, and they're still going to fix her. But since she doesn't have insurance and can't afford the entire 40 grand, Kate goes bankrupt, and the hospital has to raise the price of surgery next year to make up for the loss, which means Ginny ends up paying more for insurance. This is what happens when uninsured people get sick. It causes the price to go up for everyone else. Allowing the insurance company to deny coverage to Matt clearly didn't solve the problem. So maybe it wasn't his fault after all. Maybe the real culprit is Chris. Every time he decides to not buy insurance, it leads to a vicious spiral. So what if we require him and everyone else to buy health insurance? 
In this case, the company charges $9,200 for insurance and everyone buys it. Since the company collects exactly what it expects to spend, it doesn't have to raise the price and we finally have a stable market. What we don't have, though, is a happy country. Kate is forced to spend thousands of dollars more than she wants to, and Chris has to pay over 20 times what insurance is worth. Requiring everyone to buy insurance fixed one problem, but it may have also planted the seeds of civil war. Fortunately, in reality, most countries have more than four people, and most of those people will be relatively healthy. If the actual distribution looks like this, where most of the country is low risk, then insurance will be cheaper for everyone. Chris still has to pay more than he wants to, but it's a lot better than before. And if the government is able to offer him some kind of an incentive to buy insurance, or if he's willing to spend more than his expected value to avoid the prospect of going bankrupt, then everyone's insured and the market is stable. Returning to the United States, this is part of what the Affordable Care Act does. It requires everyone to have insurance, provides assistance to people who can't afford it, and offers incentives to people who wouldn't otherwise want it. Of course, the complete picture is more complex. A heart surgery isn't the only medical procedure. People don't know the probability that they'll need one. Insurance companies aren't content just breaking even and they charge different amounts to different people. Still, at its heart, health insurance boils down to a few key issues. Expected value, the spreading of risk among a large pool of people, and the compromise between individual choices and social well-being. And math. It also boils down to math. Peel it back, few minds properly, spark intellect, fill minds with the energy.